Ronald Reagan is the first president of the United States to have been shot during his term of office and to have survived. The following is a recreation of the events which occurred during the first day of the saving of the president. Most of the hospital staff you will see and all of the voices you will hear are those of the real participants. I am Dr. Dennis O'Leary. I heard two sharp reports. I immediately moved to the president and with my left hand grabbed his left shoulder, my right hand went around his waist, and I just drove him down and went on top of him and into the car. Ray Shattuck, my second in command, threw my feet in the president's feet in the car and slammed the door. Now, told the driver, Drew Unruh, to move out. On that day, we had a uh, cardiac arrest patient who had come in. So there was a police officer there. And he had a radio on, which all of a sudden started crackling and popping. And he got a little excited and said, there's a cop down, there's a cop down at the Hilton. I thought the Hilton was rather close to us. So I looked at the nurse and I said, maybe you should set up the other room for a trauma patient, because it sounds like somebody's been shot at the Hilton. The president said, I think you hurt my ribs when I landed on the riser. So I pushed him up into a sitting position in the right rear. As I pushed him up, I saw two things. The bullet hole in the window, and I looked out the back and I saw the three bodies. We later learned it was Tim, Carthy, and Jim Brady, and Bella Handy. And so what I did, I ran my both my hands up under his arms, on his back, and I looked under there, and I didn't see anything. There wasn't any blood on my hands. I bent him over and looked at the back of his head couldn't see anything, but he did say, my ribs, I think you, you heard him. He started getting some blood in his mouth. It was bright red, and I thought, well, we've got a rib injury here. It's probably a punctured lung. I told uh, Drew Unruh to head for GW Hospital. It was just minutes after that, the White House phone rang. There was a definite difference in the tone of the phone, the White House phone over the other phones in the emergency room. And when it rang, I just sort of looked at it and watched it ring, and Wendy finally came over and picked it up, and that's when everyone, her face just sort of went white. And this voice just said that the presidential motorcade was in the hospital. Do we know when they're coming? No. Okay, let's assume it's the president. Went back to the um, trauma side of the ER and started putting together a couple IVs. Into two, we're going to move this lady in. There was just kind of uh, sort of shouting and, you know, like, move this patient here, move this patient in here, and who's going to do this, and I'll set up the line. Dr. Colin Barnett to the ER, please. I literally had three phones in my hand. I had yanked, the White House phone was under one chin, and then the two phones on the east side of the room were in both ears, and I was calling all these different people. The presidential motorcade is on its way. We're assuming it's the president, and we need a command post set up. We had uh, our route secure back to the White House. He started developing a pallor. Every breath he would take, he couldn't quite get uh, the same amount back. I didn't think it was a gunshot wound, but I wasn't about to take a chance. And I told him, I said, we're just going to take it to GW for a check. I was uh, on the sixth floor of the hospital uh, seeing a patient. I heard the trauma team called. The other chief resident, Paul Colombani, and I were in the call room you viewing journals with John Camus when suddenly all our beepers went off. It's pretty unusual for all of us to be called at once, so it meant something was brewing, something pretty important. And I got a call from my secretary telling me that the president was uh, en route and had been shot. And I went, oh my God. I still can't get over the fact of the delay between when I know now that I was shot, but didn't know then, and the feeling of pain. I always just assumed if you were shot, you felt it and felt it right then. I was sitting in my office uh, trying to get the day together after a morning of operating when I, I heard this call over the radio. Shots rang out as President Reagan was leaving the hotel and about to enter his limousine. 
I was up in the Department of Pathology reading some slides and um, was sitting by an open window, which happened to be right over the Washington Circle entrance of the emergency room. And I saw the ambulances and the limousines coming right down Pennsylvania Avenue. And then I went out the door and hit the ramp almost simultaneously with the limousine. And um, I think the first person that stepped out was a Secret Service person. And I looked down at the president, and he sort of told me with body language, I'm going to walk in here. And the Secret Service people kind of gathered around him and started sweeping him into the emergency room. Do I remember very well walking into that emergency room, not even knowing that I'd been shot? Are you having trouble breathing? I only learned afterward in reading. I wasn't quite as well as I I thought I was at the time. What I told Ray Shattuck to do almost immediately was to set up a perimeter. It's like taking the White House to GW. I was putting some IVs together and heard a commotion and this kind of avalanche of people started moving towards the trauma bed. Um, we laid him down on the stretcher. Fine, it's regular. We're going to be taking some oxygen on him. At that point, we tore off, you know, rip, ripped off his shirt. I cut up his jacket. And at that point, Cindy, one of the technicians, put an IV in his right arm. Has the trauma team been called? The nurse looked at me and she goes, I can't get a blood pressure. I can't hear pressure. Get two big lines in I told her to get IV lines in. Why don't we put his feet up a little bit? And I listened to his chest. I thought I heard something on the left. Can we left. check this pressure? Yeah. Yeah. When Ring was um, elected, I had one nightmare that he had had a heart attack and he was brought to the hospital and I was taking care of him. And his color looked so bad and we didn't know what was going on right away. And I was sure that was what was happening to him. Can we see, can we see anything over there? And I tried to maintain eye contact with him, patted him on the head, and I kept encouraging him. And at least until his wife could get there, I was really the only basically friendly face that could uh, contact him, although everyone was being very, very supportive and nurturing. Take some deep breaths. I'm so nervous. I can't. When I realized it was the president, my hand started shaking while I was trying, was looking through a telephone book trying to make calls. And I looked at Herman, our secretary, and I said, you're, you're going to have to help me. And he said, You'll be fine. I can't help you. My hands are shaking, too. Oh, I've got the room. The first question we usually ask when you walk into that room is, who's in charge? Who's in charge? Leslie, you're the first to get here. You are. Excuse me, Dr. Price is here. Hello, oh, Mr. President. I'm Dr. Price. It was obvious that he was having trouble breathing. I knew something was wrong. Take some good deep breaths. But when I listened to him, the right side of his chest sounded deep fairly breaths. normal. Um, however, the left side, uh, there were very few sounds at all, which would indicate that there was a problem in that side of his chest. I don't hear very good breath sounds on the left side. I think you better roll him over. But we were sort of looking him over at the same time, and I noticed some sort of injury under his arm. It's like a bullet hole here, Bob. Well, it was a small hole with a blackish rim around it, some blood coming out of it. It looks like he's been shot. I'm in a car, and I think I may have broke a rib. Are you having any pain in your chest? We didn't know where the bullet was, and the injury was such that the bullet could have been very close to his heart. But it was obvious at that point that he needed one thing, and that was his, the chest tube. Just couldn't conceive the president being shot again, you know, a president. And all that time, I kept just reassuring him, you know, and telling him that everything will be fine. Some people were screaming, we need blood right away. We need blood. And so finally what I did was I ran back through the Secret Service and grabbed a tube of blood that was unlabeled. And uh, I took this tube of blood and just ran up to the lab. My main problem was running back and forth up and down those damn stairs. This is Reagan's blood? We went running down the emergency room. You know, you could see outside the sliding glass doors the large black limousine. And uh, we knew something was up then. We both ran back to the Bay Area, and as I was the chief on call for trauma, I told Paul that I would go to the left and Paul would go to the right. And David, it's the president. Okay. 
What's the blood pressure? Nothing. Blood pressure is about 80. Coming up to about 100. Okay. How many IVs you got in? At about this right, time, Dr. Joseph, Joseph Giordano arrived, and he the is the chief of the pharmacology at GW. 110. West is about to put a chest okay. tube in. Okay, we've got a size 30. Dr. Okay. Price had begun to uh, prep okay, the patient's left side of his chest. Silent he care, was going to put a chest tube in, which I think was entirely appropriate. Uh, since I was the most senior personnel there and in charge of the trauma team, I felt it was my obligation to do that. Dave, here's the chest tube. Okay. Got it? Yeah. The floor back? Okay. Okay. There's a lot of blood there. After I inserted a chest tube, uh, I also observed and noted the amount of blood that was coming out through the chest tube into the pleurivac. It's better to still want to yeah, all right. Right. stabilize it. Right. Right. blood down here as soon as possible. Okay. Get, uh, at least eight units. We're going to need eight units. Mr. President, feeling any better, sir? Short of breath? Okay, this should help a lot, all right? It's going to take out the air and the blood and so forth in your chest. All right, it should make things a lot better. All right, you just breathe. And there were at least five Secret Service people in the back, and the room itself is really small. So I, I said, you know, we've got to move people out of here. They left one or two Special Secret Service people in the back, and I got positioned at the door, and every time somebody went to go in the back, the Secret Service people would look at me and say, who's he? And go, that's the chief of surgery, he's okay. There was enough people taking care of the president and, you know, Brady and McCarthy, and I felt somebody has to take care of everybody else. And that's where I felt that where I came into play. I just continued to take care of patients in the other treatment area. And so I went back and forth in between sides to be sure that the patients were getting care for. That was mostly my role. There was a tremendous congestion of people at the entrance of the emergency room were Mike Barch and a Secret Service agent. No, he's, he's okay. He's, he's the director of the ER. Mike identified me, and I walked in. First person I saw was Dennis O'Leary. back there. And I said, what's happening? And he said, you better go back there. What's going on? The president has taken a, a bullet in the left chest. We've, uh, I feel the president was very seriously injured. But I wouldn't define him uh, as being in shock. But I think he was right at the threshold. We've given him a lot of fluid, a lot of blood. He's got chest to I think any type of delay, five minutes, ten minutes, in which he would have continued to have lost blood, he would have gone over that threshold. I think it was important uh, that the president was brought to an institution that has uh, a systematic approach to trauma. I think the establishment of trauma teams and trauma services has made a difference in the management of uh, patients with these type of injuries. Good. All right, good. It looks a little more comfortable and so forth like that. Things are going along real well, nice and smooth. The chest tube was placed and uh, resuscitation was done. Obviously, we knew we needed a thoracic surgeon, and uh, Dr. Giordano turned to me and said, uh, get Ben Aaron. At this point, Tom, we to pull Ben down. I turned around and looked down the hall, and uh, Ben Aaron was all, all already on his way in. First thing I observed was not the president himself, but in the bed next to him was Mr. Brady. And he looked, as has been described, very grim. I looked to my left. As I approached, they saw me and parted the curtain of people, and, I, and that was when I was uh, introduced to my task. Put a chest tube in. His blood pressure when he first came in was kind of low. It was responding very nicely. I guess it, it occurred to me at that time that this could easily be history repeating itself, having sort of lived through that event in Dallas when President Kennedy was shot. And I just sort of sent up a little prayer and saying, I sure hope the president isn't irretrievable at this point in time. And of course, at that point in time, it sunk home with me that he was going to be my patient. Let's get a chest x-ray. We already got one ordered. I noticed that there was a metallic fragment about a three quarters of an inch long, irregular, adjacent to the heart in the left side of his chest. And it went directly to the side of the presence table. Ben, look, there's a fragment. It's near the heart. Uh, the chest tube is in good position. There's not much pleural fluid. Uh, I don't know what the caliber of the bullet is. It's, it's deformed. I don't, know if the, I don't know if it's the whole thing. We were afraid that had it been a 38, there would be another fragment some other place. Could be in his abdomen, having gone through the diaphragm. And as it turned out, there was no fragment in his there abdomen. Could be more. It wasn't too long after that we heard that it really was a smaller caliber bullet. What we were seeing was all of it, just deformed. 
Mr. President, there's a, a lot of blood coming from your chest tube. Now, we know the bullet's in your chest, and we don't know what's been injured. But because the blood continues to come, we think it would be safest to take you to the operating room. We don't feel that you're in any immediate danger, but we think that that would be the safest thing to do rather than just watch you bleed for the next, we don't know how long. Before the president arrived, though, there was an onslaught of Secret Service men. The locker rooms are beyond the double doors past the exit sign. Right, and and asking okay. by this time what room was going to be used for the president, wanting to know what other entrances were available to that room. And so we had them change clothes into operating room greens, and they came back. I think one funny thing was one of the Secret Service men had the greens on, came back barefoot, and uh, all ready to go, he said he took his shoes off because he didn't think that was going to let him go you into the back to with the shoes. shoes and I told him, no, you know, you're going to have time to go back, get your shoes. We have his shoe covers that you can put on. So you will wait while you get your shoes. To me, the president had a number of intravenous lines and oxygen and a chest tube, a lot of paraphernalia to push along the hallway. And I remember as we began to move, and I, I decided I would station myself in front of the bed, and the bed could move no faster than I would let it move. And the purpose of that, of course, was not to allow any of the lines to become disconnected. I was standing right at the nurse's station, and I saw him very well. And what I can always remember telling somebody, he looks real gray. I wonder if he'll make it. As we rolled around into the main hallway where that little entry room, Mrs. Reagan came out, and she then walked at the president's bedside. As the entourage moved down the hall, there were more and more people tagging along. There must have been 30 people with this little one little stretcher going to the operating room and lined up along all the walls were Secret Service guys and all these DC cops. And we went by the most direct route, which was through the recovery room. As he came down the hall, and I noticed that there was no uh, bed rail on the foot of the bed. And so I grabbed the most available thing to help bring him down, which was his right foot. I'm going to take you to the operating room, Mr. President. I left for about three minutes and got into my operating clothes. Most of the things that went through my mind were the, were the things that applied to the clinical situation, and, and uh, I was using that time to kind of get my ducks in a row about what we were going to do when we got there. I suppose one of my greatest concerns was at the time they put him to sleep, he might really fall apart. Good. President Reagan was wheeled into the room. <laughs> there were just people everywhere that I'd never seen so many people in an operating room. There were about eight Secret Service men in greens in the room. You could hardly see the president for all of these people. Some of the people in the room were dressed a little funny. Their hats were on crooked and their masks were on wrong. Uh, they obviously didn't know exactly where they were supposed to stand in order not to get things contaminated in the surgical field. So we had to tell them a few things, but uh, they all caught on pretty quickly. And all in all, the Secret Service uh, men and actually everybody from the White House staff stayed out of the way and, and let the surgical team and the medical team do their job. Is that better? Does that help? And I kind of squeezed his hand a minute because he looked like he needed a little reassurance with all this confusion happening. And the anesthesia people said, you know, we're going to be putting you to sleep now. I, I think there was one thing that really struck me as unusual in that in looking at the anesthesia team, Dr. Morales, Dr. Chin, and myself, I realized that we were all naturalized Americans. We were getting ready to put him to sleep. It was at that time that he sort of lifted his head up off the operating table. Sounds good. The president asked, uh, I hope all you people are Republican. Well, I'm not a Republican, I'm a Democrat. And so I said, famous president, we're all Republicans. <laughs> Here's a man who was just shot. He's had the daylights scared out of him. And, and it was almost as though he wanted to put us at ease around him. And that was very impressive. Get ready to, uh, to get started. The first procedure that was done after the president was put to sleep was a uh, Procedure we use to assess whether or not there's been any bleeding in the abdominal cavity, and we call that a peritoneal lavage. 
It doesn't take very long, and it's very accurate, and uh, it's not any risk to the patient. Uh, and once we clear fluid returned, we were quite confident that the president did not have a major intra-abdominal bleed. By the time I got to the operating room, the patients were already in the operating room suites, and what I saw was enormous numbers of people crowding the halls. I saw a need for someone to begin organizing crowds. Can I talk to who's ever in charge? Who's ever in charge of the horses? Can I see it for a minute, please? We have a problem. The halls are really too crowded. We've got a lot of traffic. Is there any way we can clear out some of these people? Can some of these people be assigned to a nearby hallway? There's just too much congestion here. The number of times that phone rang was unreal. A lot of calls from people who would say, I'm from radio station, TV station, journal, paper, and I began developing my standard you know, answer, which is, I'm, I'm very sorry, I can't help you, goodbye. No, I'm sorry, I'm not giving any information. Thank you, goodbye. Operating on this question, I help you. Can you ease up on the lung bagging just a little bit, please? The first thing we saw when we opened up the chest was the lung expanded and the bullet hole in the lung. Mm, no. We could quickly see that the bullet had not moved out of the lung. Yes, uh, well, I think probably the 30, but I haven't spotted this thing yet, so. We had to devise some way of really locating the bullet within this spongy substance of the lung. When we were looking for the bullet, it was very tense. You, you could kind of feel the air was heavy with expectation. Okay. And it was about that time that Dutch Lickman, one of the anesthesiologists, and he kind of looked over there and he kind of break the ice. He says, uh, Ben, are you having a good time? Dutch, I'm just having a marvelous time down here. Couldn't be better. And then it was just shortly thereafter that he found it. And he said, I think I've got it. I think I've got it. Just one second, we'll have it. All right, there it is. I felt relieved. It was kind of, everybody could let their breath out almost like a eureka moment. I may have even said it. I'm not sure, but it's how I felt. I'll take that bullet, please, doctor. Okay. There was a growing awareness of the need to communicate with the media and therefore with the public. And there was around 5.30, uh, the decision was made that the spokesperson should be a doctor. Uh, we then proceeded to move across the street and we got over to the medical school building into the Ross Hall lecture room. To report that the president is the now press conference in the started at 7:15, and it was really a garish to determine whether sight, there was any blood bright in the lights, they tons of electronic wake. equipment. The president I mean, you really have a little bit of the sensation that you have walked into the 80s. You have a sense that you were in the middle of a dream. You're really going to wake up, and this wasn't all happening. The bullet entered from just under the left axilla, traversed down about three inches. Is the president still under anesthetic? No, he is awake now. How long will you be in the hospital? That is always difficult to say. The president, however, is an excellent physical specimen. As that and announcement came out over the TV, uh, we crowded around the little screen up in the intensive care unit. It just became very obvious that uh, while we were supposed to receive the president, and it was time for him to be out of the operating room, uh, he, didn't, he didn't show. I called about 7.30 uh, and asked to talk to one of the anesthesiologists. Uh, what's the story on the president? I understand that he's out of surgery and in the recovery room. Do you know when we can expect him up here in the ICU? Jack, I believe that they have decided to keep him down here because of security. The indication that I got was that they were thinking of keeping him in the recovery room that night. The recovery unit, which had everything available that the intensive care unit has, was just about empty by this time of day. I basically implemented that decision that we would take him to the recovery unit until he was extubated and stable. Dr. Morales, he's having a lot of pain. Can we give him something for it? Please give him about five milligrams of morphine intravenously. The moment I walked into the recovery room, Ben, from the word go, says, We've got to take care of the president as we, as, as we would anybody. You know, the magnitude of his office out of the situation to, uh, to deal with him as we would with anybody. 
he appeared air hungry, he would point to the tube and um, from experience knowing that he was trying to say, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I know, no, don't pull at it now. That it was is clear to Denny and I that he had obvious secretions in his lungs. Dr. Jack Zimmerman suggested to us that we instill saline and bag the patient. Mr. Reagan, what Denny and I are going to do is give you big breaths of air. I was trying to soothe him and tell him that I'm breathing for you. This is a treatment that's uncomfortable but necessary. You're going to have to let me breathe for you. You're going to have to trust me. And when I said those words, I thought, you know, geez, I'm asking the President of the United States to trust me, and I'm just a nurse doing my job. You have to trust me and let me do the breathing. Mr. Ray, you're doing just fine. Just relax. You'll be all right. I was able to get through the, the evening relatively well by trying to block out the fact that he was the president by referring to him as Mr. Reagan instead of Mr. President. We have several clipboards lying around. I handed him a clipboard and a pencil. He wanted to know if anyone else had been hurt. Yeah, there were two other people who were shot, but they're okay. Don't worry about them. They'll be, they're fine. And you just need to worry about getting yourself he wrote another note saying, did they, did they get the guy who did it? And I told him that they had. They got him. They got him. And around 3 a.m., uh, he was removed from the respirator. And I know that that roughly half-hour period, 45-minute period after the tube was taken out of his windpipe, breathing through an oxygen mask, the president probably put on his only performance that was ever, ever went on through an oxygen mask. Uh, he had jokes to tell, and it was, was very obvious to everybody that uh, this man was celebrating life. That went on for perhaps as long as an hour. I can recall sometime around 4 a.m. trying to suggest that the people get away from his bedside and let him get some rest. So they all moved away from the bed. Okay. And I covered... Mr. Reagan's eyes, because he had a lot of sights on him there, and pleaded with him to, you know, try to get a little rest. In the most polite way I can tell you this, when I put this cover over your eyes, I want you to go to sleep. One of the nurses produced the screen, the recovery room lights went out, and the president finally got a couple hours sleep before we moved him up to the intensive care unit. 6.15 the next morning. In the early morning hours, in the recovery room, when it was down to just a handful of people, it was very surrealistic. There's the beep, beep, beep. And there's the President of the United States laying in the recovery room, and it's a time when you're going, oh, some history's happening right here. I don't normally make house calls, but I considered it appropriate to make house call in this situation. Doctors Gins, Columbani, and I went to see him. We all piled into Ben Aaron's uh, car and drove down to the White House. And we drove right up onto the, the little circular driveway that leads up to the White House. And then we went to the president's uh, quarters. I feel good. At that time, I knew he uh, certainly was recuperating well because he looked very healthy. The uh, color had come back to his cheeks, and he was in very good spirits. Well, I wonder, could I ask a technical question, though? Surely. Well, I understand that you really kind of loaded me up with other people's blood <laughs> about a whole full tr charge. Now, am I back on my own blood now? And if so, where'd the other blood go? That blood, I thought it was, history was being very kind to us here at GW. That crossed my mind a number of times. And everybody worked together just like they've been living together entire life. kind of thing you go back and you think, now, is there anything we would have done any different? But there really wasn't. We've all hashed over the things that everything came off about as well as it possibly could have. There was I feel that I was very lucky. 
very lucky that we went where we went and when we did and you know and uh, but i i am grateful to all of you the saving of the president is a portrayal of an extraordinary event one which hopefully will never happen to any of us again however in one sense it was not extraordinary the same kinds of committed people and facilities do the same life-saving things every day for less well-known victims of trauma. Serious injuries have always been a part of life, but today the resources of academic and other major medical centers have been integrated to save lives that were once forfeit, while the delivery of everyday patient care continues uninterrupted. This is the end product of years of medical research, education, and patient experience which are the distinctive features of our nation's academic health centers. And on this particular day, at that moment in history, the result was the saving of the life of a president of the United States of America.